Hello, everyone, and welcome to this panel. This is uh, part of the first European Online Forum uh, within the World uh, Artificial Intelligence Conference uh, 2021. Uh, I'm Marco Maritati. I'm co-CEO of Motosoprandi.com. Motosoprandi is an innovative cloud AI robotics company. That's why the, the, the topic of this panel is about uh, smart cloud revolution in industry 4.0. Cloud technology is a boost for the next industrial revolution that enterprises are already living. So we'd like to discuss what is the state of the art and what is the, the, the future of uh, this technology. And to talk about this, I have the honor to introduce five distinguished experts starting in alphabetical order from uh, Mr. Riyad Chalali. Mr. Riyad is a professor of AI and robotics at Nanjing University. Uh, Mr. Chalali, could you please introduce yourself uh, better than I did? Thanks. Uh, okay, thank you so much. I will share uh, my screen. Okay. So that you know more about me. This is me with the camel in uh, the deep uh, China in uh, Gansu province. Um, uh, actually, uh, well, I'm an academic, let's say, half academic uh, person. Uh, I graduated from the University of uh, Paris. I have the Doctorate of Science. I'm working in robotics since 30 years now. I'm, say, I'm the first generation of uh, researchers in uh, robotics. I worked in uh, many countries, including uh, Obviously, France, uh, Italy, China, Japan, Russia, Canada, and Mexico. As I said, I'm half academic because I, since more than 15 years now, I put a, a, a foot in industry and I'm running also my uh, own companies. I'm also partner in, uh, in models. So exactly my duties, I'm first professor at the university I'm CTO for a company in Hong Kong called Textbotics, dealing with uh, uh, autonomous agents, including mobile uh, robots. Uh, I'm a co-founder and a CTO of uh, a company called AI Drones in Nanjing. We are dealing with uh, not only drones, but drones are the main segment and uh, we have autonomous drones. And I have also another company dealing with uh, biomedical devices called the Kita Technologies. And uh, this is uh, basically all my duties. I have other parallel duties, but uh, it's enough. Thank you. Thanks to you, Mr. Chalali, and uh, thanks to Jody's panel. And now I'd like to introduce Mr. Gianluca Giorgi. Gianluca Giorgi is a CEO and founder of ES Automation and Consulting. And uh, it will show your easy presentation, thanks. Sure. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Can you see now my screen? Uh, no. Yes, no. Yeah, okay. Uh, here is Luca Giorgi. Uh, I'm, as, I'm the CEO of the S Automation Consulting. Uh, I'm also the CEO of Opera Mess and the CTO. Opera Mess is, a, is a, a manufacturing execution system software for, for managing the production line. And then uh, I'm the CEO also of the LAC Logistic Automation Consulting, uh, where we uh, support uh, for uh, improve the, the logistic part of the factory. And uh, Ofrikea is uh, one of my startup uh, we handle uh, some patent uh, belong to the ozone uh, uh, generator and uh, for sterilize the hospital, uh, hotel, uh, home, uh, and uh, dog bed, and uh, belong to the Sterilato brand. Uh, I go on to the next step. I'm an uh, uh, automation engineer, software automation engineer, uh, since uh, 1986. 
And I started as a, as a talent in 1983 in C language uh, for in IBM, uh, where I was moved inside IBM University. Now, no more IBM as their own university. At that time, they had their own one. After that, I moved uh, uh, to work for GE Fanuc Automation uh, uh, for uh, manage the system integration uh, in the system integration department. And after that, I moved to digital electronics, uh, where I got the university, the digital electronic university degree for, for uh, as an operating system manager in VMS, Unix, Ultrix systems. And then I move on in my, my career, working for uh, several companies. Uh, I was the National Instruments uh, in Italy engineer for develop uh, application, uh, special application in La View and La Windows CY. And then I developed some special uh, plant uh, in automatic warehouse in 1990 using neutral nets and uh, uh, some inter artificial intelligence algorithms for optimize uh, the performance of the plant. I was founded on 2002 by, because I made the first machine in the world for the uh, uh, sending machine, wood, uh, woodworking sending machine using fuzzy logic. And then uh, I, after that, I moved uh, to work for automotive business for more than five years before coming to China. Uh, I work for Ferrari, Fiat, uh, now it's FCA, Magneti Marelli, Lombardini Engines, uh, Fiat Avio in aviation, uh, in the sport car, racing, and many others. And uh, then on 2005, I moved to China, and uh, I followed here some project in the, in the, in the China plants for optimize and uh, uh, the production line and connect the, 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 the data acquisition system from, uh, from production line to the server. And uh, from since 2010, uh, I'm also mentor about the Galaxy Group, Chennai, is the Silicon Valley, Shenzhen Silicon Valley, and the Fubao incubators in Shenzhen for several uh, projects in, uh, in the industry automation, <clears throat> in Chennai for some artificial intelligence connected with the machine, uh, the, the CNC machine, and in Fubao, where we uh, we have also the developing system for uh, for uh, uh, blockchain project from Hong Kong and Grey Bay area. Uh, I'm also certified the MIT for the the, the blockchain, uh, where we are following now uh, several projects. Uh, in my resources, uh, we have resources and services in this page. We have around 13 and academics experts that collaborate with me in several projects. Uh, according to the topic, we, we configurated the team that work in that project. And we have around 25 junior engineers, according to the project, uh, full over China, because we know China is too big so for follow in only, only one office. So we are uh, distributing all over China. We have services like logistic optimization, industrial plant design, special machine design, because we have also one factory for China where we produce project to produce special machines. A data acquisition project for, for like a SCADA system. And then we, we analyze and we manage the data using artificial intelligence algorithms. And we also, uh, now we are, since last year, uh, we started to create uh, and project uh, some uh, blockchain architecture uh, for uh, traceability of the product in, uh, in several fields. Uh, some of our customers here, yeah, uh, where we develop uh, the, the project, some other, uh, we have done some NDA so we cannot share uh, for special project and, uh, and that's all. Thanks, Mr. Dorji. Welcome, uh, let me stop the sharing. And now I'd like to introduce Mr. Gianfranco Lanini. Gianfranco is the head of business development at Leonardo. So please, Gianfranco. Okay, can you see the screen? Yes, clearly. Okay, so just... Okay, so I'm Gianfranco Lanini. I'm a, an aerospace engineer. I graduate from Napoli Federico II University. After, uh, when I, after the university, 
I moved to the Italian Air Force uh, as a, a junior officer, uh, but after two years, I entered in what was then Alinea, that now is Leonardo. Uh, started my activities uh, as a manufacturing engineer. I spent um, almost half of my professional life in the United States, working uh, especially in connection with Boeing. Uh, I returned to Italy uh, in 2010, spent a couple of days, a couple of years uh, working as program manager on the Boeing 787, returned in the U.S. as head of Boeing programs. I also managed the F-35 contract with Lockheed Martin and the Italian Department of Defense. Went, uh, then I had the business development in North America. Uh, for December 2018, I had business development for aerostructure division, uh, mainly focused into China. Uh, so actually, it's one year that I'm full time in China. We're working in establishing uh, a joint venture with a local company uh, to have a facility here working in some aerospace programs. So this is kind of an overview of what uh, I'm doing now. Uh, I don't know why it doesn't go to the next. Okay, just to give an, a brief idea of Leonardo. Leonardo's got four main uh, uh, sectors, helicopter, uh, defense electronic, uh, electronics and security, aeronautics, which is my area, and space. Uh, so uh, mainly, you see, we have EO 100% uh, uh, ownership, or we have uh, several joint ventures. Uh, our customers are really spread all around the world. In terms of economics of the company, we have about 13.4 billion of revenues in 2020. Uh, we have a backlog that it's almost uh, three times uh, the revenues. Uh, another point, uh, of course, is that 12% uh, of our revenues are spent in research and development. Uh, this makes us the number two in Europe and the number four in the world in terms of percentage for major companies. So we're looking uh, very strongly in research and development. What we have done uh, in the last two years, we have created a network of laboratories. They are called Leonardo Lab. They are almost in Italy, but some also in the US, in which we connect uh, the, the company with the university and some other uh, company, like the one that we have with our structures is uh, with the Federico Secondo, but also with Solvay, which is a Belgian company, but is one of the top three uh, producer of composite material. So uh, that is kind of the approach that we were having uh, to follow research and development. Uh, many are aware that our major uh, shareholder is the Italian Ministry of Economics, but also we have uh, institutional investors that make us kind of a public company we have very strict requirement of course due to that just give an idea of our global presence uh, we have almost 50,000 people 60 percent are in italy but 83 percent of the revenue come from international market uh, as you can see we are quite spread we are we have site and industrial plant in 46 uh, countries uh, so here in China, we have a joint venture for uh, uh, helicopters. Uh, we are building this other joint venture for aerostructures. Uh, our radar serves 23 airports in China, uh, so for the electronic division. So uh, and in fact, we consider also UK, US and Poland as domestic market. So, and of course, now we are uh looking into china uh we have uh, one office in beijing which is that quarter uh we have another brand office here in shanghai which uh, i'm leading and uh, we're looking at several areas of development in china uh 
beside, uh, of course, aerostructure, it's mainly composite structures. There are several areas that are involving. You can look at uh, uh, electric vehicles, uh, electric bus, uh, uh, delivery drones, fast trains. There are a lot of things that are moving in this country very fast that are good opportunities for business uh, in this moment. So I, I think that would be kind of all for me. Thank you, Mr. Lanini, and uh, thank also to join uh, this panel. Now uh, I'd like to introduce Mr. Cordolicata. Cordolicata is the CEO of IOMS Group, and uh, he will start to show his presentation. Yes, Marco. Okay. So, uh, can you see? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay, good. Uh, a few words about me. Um, um, I'm based in uh, Shanghai for the past five years, and I have an experience in Asia for the past 25 years in uh, metals projects. Um, I decided to set up uh, a business uh, with two partners. This was about three years ago. And uh, we target uh, uh, small and medium companies in the heavy industry to support them in uh, digitalization and uh, optimization uh, processes. Uh, processes. So we basically service uh, service providers and the expertise which we, we cover, we, we call them domains, are in uh, the metals, basically steel and um, non-ferrous like aluminum and uh, copper. Uh, we also support uh, processes for cement and uh, industrial water treatments. Uh, what, uh, what we like to do is to support our clients who are starting the digitalization uh, directly from, from their shop floor uh, without, uh, let's say, uh, being aggressive and um, overhauling completely all their systems. So going basically in uh, the areas where there is the, the highest potential of benefit from, uh, from the digitalization. So the idea is that we are transposing uh, the expertise of um, the people in my organization. I'm, I, I am the youngest from this point of view um, into uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning model in order to, to have uh, online uh, prediction systems. Uh, at the moment we are focusing uh, quality, uh, but of course, because we are, we are treating a large amount of data and they are the same data we can also move into um, maintenance and predictive maintenance, which at the moment we are not covering specifically with our uh, efforts because these are already made by, by other, um, other companies. So, and also the idea is to make it as, as friendly as possible. So using uh, cloud, uh, wherever is accepted and um, web interfaces. So there is absolutely no interference with the existing automation uh, of the of the existing plan, and we like to uh, show you know where the where the effects of the digitalization and the optimization of the other processes are going into. So the idea is that uh, you know all the all the all the big uh, push, especially here in China for the mega cities, uh, is going to have uh, uh, go to have products which are uh, definitely uh, coming from circular uh, economy models and uh, they are efficiently uh, produced, so reducing uh, the rate of rejections and of course, improving the, the, the performance of, uh, of the products, uh, the products them, themselves in an in, in in industrial, of course, environment. So many things people don't see, of course, but they are already, let's say, embedded in the places where they live or when they, when they move around in trains or, or, other, um, or other way of, uh, of moving. So this completes my introduction. Thanks, Mr. Licata. And now I'd like to introduce Mr. Eric Liu. Eric Liu is a CTO and founder of Digitwin. Please, Eric, show us your work. Thanks. Sure. So yeah, my name is Eric Liu. I'm the CTO and uh, founder of Digitwin. Um, just a little bit about uh, myself. Uh, my background is not as, um, I would say, impressive as uh, the esteemed colleagues here today. Um, but um, basically, my background, um, I'm from originally from uh, 
I was born in China in Nanjing and then moved to the United States, um, have a computer science degree and then moved to the West Coast to Silicon Valley. So my background primarily focused on human computer interaction, starting with the video game spaces. Um, and I basically started to understand that, you know, because we're humans, 90% um, of information actually comes through our vision as well as the uh, UI and UX elements. So um, what's unique about that is that I actually worked on uh, a company where it was pre-AWS, pre-cloud days. And we actually had to have completely physical servers to scale, right? Because as we know, the entertainment space uh, for video games, like we all know, we probably heard of massive multiplayer games that requires tons and tons of cloud and, and uh, computational power. So um, basically I worked on that before the cloud days um, and actually have witnessed uh, sort of how AWS as well as all the other cloud technologies have uh, sort of grew up. Um, and then I moved back uh, to China in 2015 um, because prior to that, I was actually at NVIDIA uh, because NVIDIA, as we all know these days, um, it's surprising that uh, NVIDIA is actually worth more than Intel uh, these days because of uh, computer vision and AI uh, and cloud technology. So um, I wanted to sort of, um, sort of uh, bring back the Silicon Valley uh, technologies as well as the understanding of technologies and how, um, because there's so much data in China, uh, digital twins is becoming such a very major uh, business. So that's my background. Um, the main thing that we focus on, right, because there's a physical world, uh, as we all know, uh, it's very limited. However, there's so many different or digital layers, right? For example, all around us right now in every single room or every single computer, we can't see this data. However, it's all around us, whether it's electricity or water or waste or anything like that. At the same time, there's other types of digital layers that we can actually try to understand from the spatial perspective. So when we talk about human computer spatial interaction, that's exactly what we do. We enable human beings to understand this data because there's petabytes, if not more, of data just going between machine to machine. But when it comes to human computer interaction, this is the thing that we need to understand as human beings and how to interact with it. So uh, the digital twin stages and maturity level um, from uh, our perspective right now is actually, we are getting to the point where a digital twin means sort of a, dig a digital uh, recreation, one-on-one -on -one representation of the physical space. So whether that means it's an assembly line for manufacturing, for smart manufacturing, or it could be a smart city where potentially you can actually simulate and also see the real-time information of cars, right? Whether it's for mobility or transportation or other digital layers, right? Whether it's energy, right? Because we work very, very, very close with Schneider Electric as well. Uh, but of course, when it comes to more mature uh, technologies or the process and stages that we've moved forward, we look into simulation because of big data, right? Because of machine learning algorithms. Then we can actually understand and predict potentially what would happen with machinery or cities or other things. So um, the thing that about us that we focus on is the full stack element, right? Um, like I said, from the beautiful experiences that we interact with on our cell phones uh, or large screens or computers, right? all the way down to the data itself. So where does this data come from? Is it from a PLC or MES system of um, a digital twinned assembly line? Or is it from a smart city? Right? Smart city, there's so many, it's such a large concept, right? Whether it's you know autonomous cars or whether it's 5G telecommunications, all of this to us is whether it's static data or dynamic data. And we actually enable our customers to actually interact with it whether, like I mentioned earlier, urban planning, smart cities, smart factories, ports, power plants, et cetera. So that's really what uh, I focus on these days. Um, and when it comes to uh, digi twins and digital twins in general, it's really the next generation of digitalization, right? How do we mimic and understand the physical world in a digital environment so that we no longer have to actually go potentially to the physical location? Thank you. Thanks, Eric, uh, very interesting. And uh, as you can see, as the audience can see, you are uh, all prestigious experts coming from different fields of industry, of course, uh, different parts of the world. So it can be interesting in just in a few words, uh, have uh, um, your point of view of the definition of industry for, for 4.0. So starting from uh, Mr. Chalali. 
What's in your opinion, the, the definition of industry 4.0? Uh, you want me to be politically correct or uh, straight? <laughs> uh, okay, uh, I have two, two opinions actually. Uh, one is uh, as a researcher, um, I would say that the 4.0 is a, um, well, it's a standard and as uh, each standard is, is, is not optimal. And for, uh, for some countries around the world, it was the way to impose their uh, solutions. But this is the, the bad side of the industry 4.0. On the other hand, um, I have an example in mind about robotics and uh, ROS system. I don't know if you are familiar with the ROS system. Uh, Google developed this uh, standard actually, and it became the let's say the richest place uh, of open source dealing with robotics. So this accelerated, accelerated the uh, robotics applications in, a, in crazy way. So you have the bad side of the standardization, but you have the, the very best side of the, uh, uh, of the standardization. And I, I will keep in mind uh, 4.0 is a, a good way actually uh, because uh, since uh, it started, it, uh, it increased the interoperability of uh, thousands or millions of uh, devices and systems. Uh, and this reaches the, the actually the, the, it allowed our, the, uh, more collaborations and the more we collaborate, we, the more we produce and the more we are rich. So I'm, uh, Let's say I'm very satisfied in the, in the philosophy of 4.0 actually. Uh, but I, I keep in mind that the, uh, at the beginning it's a, uh, it was a sort of a rail imposed to, uh, this is a, my research in mind speaking. <laughs> so uh, I need freedom actually to, to, to think. But for industry, I, I think definitely it's a, uh, it's a good standard. Okay, thanks. Gianluca, please. Uh, in your opinion, is it a label or, or what is your definition of industry 4.0? I also have the two, the two versions. We can say even three because in China, we have also the China industry 4.0. But uh, we're talking about industry 4.0 as an industrial revolution, you know. Uh, and uh, in political point of view, this industrial revolution uh, um, uh, relive, uh, uh, renew what was the industry for 3.0. Because uh, uh, when uh, around 2003, 2004, the automation field in Europe and all over the world was only in the hand of the automotive business when they needed to renew the gas, but all the other was more or less uh, uh, dormant. Uh, so the, the, with the industry 4.0, including uh, as a technology for transmitting the data internet, uh, because it's the most different part of the, the, the IoT, and so internet of things, uh, we're talking about the internet introducing in the, in the uh, industry 3.0 revolution, because we're still uh, talking about, uh, uh, I, I use a token ring for transmitting the data, and when I work in IBM, I still chatting with my friends in USA every day. So uh, nothing changed in front of what we done. Only the system changed according to, to the internet user today. So one side, the industrial revolution, uh, renew the market, create a new business. Uh, Germany was quite smart with the Siemens to create this one for for, for improve the market of, the, of this kind of a product, uh, all connected with the industry 4.0. And uh, they was much more smart because they convinced China is the best way for follow for uh, the, the industrialization of a China market. So China uh, grant uh, joined the industry 4.0 uh, for uh, improve the production in China of this industry. So this is, uh, we can say the political business side. In technical point of view, uh, in, in different from 30 years ago, as I said, we have more speed. We have internet, we have a, a new solution. Uh, in, the, in the Now we have many IC, fast IC in small devices. Uh, 
so we can transmit the data more easy. We don't need to develop any uh, strange driver for communicating to computer each other like, like we done 30 years ago. And more, everything more easy, much more plug and play. So this one support uh, the, the exchange data and the acquire of data. Because if today we have the, the big data, uh, we don't have 30 years ago big data, uh, even we have artificial intelligence algorithms and, and theory the same. Uh, today we have the big data because of the new devices, because of the internet, because of the uh, 4G, and now we have 5G, uh, are allowed to create the big data. Uh, what not, not happened 30 years ago. So the uh, industry 4.0 and all the connected together because uh, the industry 4.0 is uh, the same uh, point of view engine pushed the, the, to become a fi, uh, the 5G because we are going to use the IoT more and more. So the data become more and more and the band become limits. So increasing the speed and increasing the wide of the band for transmitting the data uh, this, uh, this topic, the industry 4.0, give the, the power for innovate, for create, and, uh, and uh, give also the new life to the artificial intelligence, because we know that the artificial intelligence passed uh, so many winter period, okay? We can many cold period, nobody want to invest in there. Uh, in 1990, nobody support me in the algorithms, nobody will take care about AI. So uh, I think it's, a, it's a good for business, it's a good for develop new technology, for develop, for let the guy, the new student, for let us renew ourselves in the new technology, for start to study again, and uh, I think is uh, everything uh, good for for all over uh, the business around uh, around this topic. Thanks, Gianluca, and uh, Giancarlo. Um, in your with your experience in your field, uh, what industry four point zero means? Okay, so for uh, if I look at the industrial point, it's uh, something very positive. Uh, of course, uh, especially the aerospace industry is still very reliable on uh, manual work. It can be strange, but uh, uh, of course you have area of not accessibility. Uh, some, some things still are very close to, uh, like 40 years ago was very similar. So of course, uh, uh, for industry 4.0, especially on the robotic side, that could be a very uh, important uh, step forward. In terms of uh, uh, data transfer, on that, of course, the aerospace industry has been uh, more prudent on that because, of course, uh, all uh, uh, aerospace industries work on commercial, but mainly on defense. So they are very, very prudent about uh, getting their data uh, shared and uh, open to attack. So that is kind of, of course, is uh, the reason why we are more prudent. Uh, one other very important thing, and I was thinking what uh, Eric was saying, is the digital twin. Uh, uh, we have a very complex production line, and of course, to have a digital twin uh, uh, can strongly reduce our learning curve, our cost at the beginning. So that is very, very positive. But if I have to look broader on the social standpoint, uh, I think these uh, will quite change the scenario uh, because uh, actually most of the human made activities, uh, especially at lower level will be replaced either by cobots, robots, artificial intelligence. And so we run the risk, especially in first world, second world countries, to have a big unemployment if we don't look at the industry 4.0 as a whole and what shall be done. Uh, so uh, the politics shall not drop their head into the sand, but look at what's happening in the industrial world with industry 4.0 and look what are best solution to how to deal with this progress. The progress, it's happening. It's not going to be stopped. But of course, we need to understand what are 
what will drive also on the social side and or uh, uh, employment side. So of course we need uh, training, higher skill training. Uh, we need uh, to understand if the work hours are still needs to be what they are now. We need to look at the global standpoint, what's happening. Thanks, Gianfranco. And uh, I think that uh, your point of view, I mean, the, the, the working in, in the defense would be very interesting in the second uh, question I, I will do later. Uh, but, but now I would like to, to to see to uh, to hear what uh, Corrado thinks about. Uh, are you agree with uh, you agree with uh, Gianfranco? Well, certainly uh, the social uh, let's say impact is uh, is very important. Uh, in order to let's say avoid the, the discussion to reach that point when I am uh, I am presenting my solutions to a broad audience because you know usually you 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 start from the top. Of the factory, but at a certain point, you know, you need to to talk with the with the middle management and even sometimes with the shop floor people. So we always present this industry 4.0 digitalization, industrial IoT, and you name it, as an augmentation, you know, of uh, people's intelligence and of course uh, as a as a complement to automation. Uh, actually, we see it from uh, at the moment from uh, from this point of view. Uh, but of course, let's say the, um, uh, the ghost or the spectrum that this is going to look like a real monster uh, for, uh, for a lot of, uh, of blue collars, uh, it exists certainly. So it is important to, let's say, use a lot of emotional intelligence when you are, uh, when you are presenting the, these things. But it's definitely, let's say, the, the, the digital twin, uh, let's say, analogy uh, speaks very well in this respect. Uh, of course, we need to consider that uh, a full uh, industry 4.0, I don't think it, it exists in, uh, in, in many locations, let's say today. I don't think there are fully digital factories, or probably there are, but uh, <laughs> I don't know them. There are factories which are partially, let's say, boosted by, uh, by the power of big data and utilization of, uh, of machine learning. So it is in progress. Um, and it is, uh, it is, uh, it is gone. But it's, it's certainly. I mean, for myself, uh, it's, it's, it's really amazing how you can use the, the power of, uh, of the data to, to find insights in your, uh, in your process, which before uh, you could find really, let's say, many hours later, or even, you know, days later, uh, utilizing, let's say, a lot of expertise from, uh, from people. So that's what. Uh, you know, draw us in the beginning to say, we have to use the expertise of the people, you know, in order to, to put it in a system, which is, is really intelligent because automation is not intelligent. Automation is stupid. It's following exactly what you're telling the system to do. Uh, so the, the, big, uh, the big leap, the big step with the, with the industry 4.0 is related to, to the learning, uh, the learning part of the, uh, of, of the, of the systems. Thanks, interesting, and, uh, and I agree with this point of view. Uh, Eric, please, uh, what is your opinion about, uh, about it? Yeah, Industry 4.0 is interesting, right? Um, it, I, I completely agree um, with everyone so far when it term, comes to sort of the technology stack, right? Um, because of certain other industries that are sort of culminating together uh, through the use of internet, computers, right, automation, Energy 4.0, right? There's a science behind it called uh, cyber physical systems, right? The science and the digital twin, from my perspective, is the application into different industries. So, um, with the advent of sort of a CPS plus uh, AI plus robotics uh, plus you know telecommunications at 5G, eventually 6G, we are on the precipice of moving towards a transformation, right? To become sort of a you know fully automated uh, type of, uh, you know, digital twin or cyber physical systems. However, um, I completely agree where, you know, there needs to be a moral and ethic sort of committee, right, as we move forward, because um, as human beings are sort of pushing towards the automation stages, if once things become fully automated, for example, if we use an example of autonomous vehicles, right, at level five full autonomy, uh, they can drive themselves and they will make decisions on our behalf, right, on human beings' behalf. So that becomes an ethical issue because if an autonomous car wants to sort of, 
you know, sees through computer vision, uh, would they potentially, you know, run into a family or run you off a cliff? That, that becomes such a interesting topic when it comes to artificial intelligence and cloud computing. So uh, yeah, again, you know, it's always about sort of moving towards the, um, how sort of the human progress in the future However, you know, as we as we're keep pushing along ourselves as well as different industries into full autonomy, we should always stop, smell the roses, and think about exactly what we're doing. Are we replacing a lot of jobs? Which absolutely it will happen, right? Absolutely. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of other you know thought leaders in the uh, AI industries are saying that hey, um, they will get dispersed, but then they will learn new skills potentially, right? So. Maybe they will be, you know, robotics, uh, uh, you know, uh, maintenance people or something else. So, so yeah, I mean, Industry 4.0, again, is a transformation. We're slowly but surely getting pushed towards that direction, uh, starting with manufacturing. Um, and especially, you know, there's really two countries in the world that are really, um, you know, shelled us the ground doing smart cities from scratch. Uh, one is uh, obviously China. Uh, the other is Saudi Arabia. Uh, no other cities, no other countries in the world are basically saying, you know, I'm going to create a brand new uh, city from with from land, right? Basically, nothing there, and um, have, you know, for example, from Saudi Arabia, the Neon Project, 500 billion U.S. dollar, a smart city, right? So, so it's really interesting how we are starting to move towards that direction in these multiple industries. And um, again, you know, we should always sort of stop and smell the roses. Yeah, of course, it's a, it's a big work in progress. And uh, thanks, great. And then um, now I want to, to, to ask you um, a pretty delicate uh, question. Uh, what about uh, security? Of course, applied in your field. Uh, do you think the, the cloud is secure for the factories? Starting from uh, Mr. Cellani, please. Turn on your mic, please. Sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, the security is uh, exactly the at the same level of ethics in terms of uh, importance. Uh, it's a topic to have to be considered as a top priority. Uh, we, we, it's impossible to have a secure system hundred percent. This is a, this is impossible. Uh, what we can have is. A, uh, uh, some percentage of, uh, of security. And depending on the area where, where, where we are, we, my friend was talking about uh, aeronautics, it's the, the tolerance is uh, zero. So uh, could we have uh, secure systems? For now, um, I'm not sure. Uh, because the theory says that there is no secure system. Uh, how to increase the security? Well, there are um, new new technologies like the uh, like the optics or um, some new algorithms to, to increase the security. But for 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 me, as a, a theoretical guy, um, uh, I can guarantee there's no uh, security for 100 percent. Do you asymptotically you can uh, tend to 100 percent, but the price to pay is high. So high. yeah, this is the, the, the this is the story now. The more you pay, the more you have uh, security uh, because in any case you cannot have it. Yeah, clear. This this is. Uh, uh, more true with the, um, uh, the the GPUs now are very popular. So you have a very powerful computing uh, capabilities for, for nothing. So to crack any any security system is uh, it's not that uh, uh, expensive as it, it was in the past. So you don't need to be a state actually to have a powerful uh, or to have the computational power to, to actually to crack uh, systems this is what uh, this is what i can say actually uh, i just want to add a remark about the um, the ethics 
as for any technology, uh, we have uh, always duality. Any technology can be used for the good or for the bad. It's up to us to, to make the choice. Uh, so this is true for 4.0, 4 for any other, for AI or for any other technology. So it's up to us to choose the right use of uh, our uh, inventions, actually. Yeah, yeah. Even for the law, there is a dual use. <laughs> I agree. I always say also a knife. You can use a knife for a good use or, or a bad use. Uh, just a few words. Uh, Gianluca, please, um, which is uh, your idea? Uh, there, there's a balance. Uh, more or less, uh, I agree con, uh, together with Ryan. Uh, but I think the security, uh, you know, in MIT, we study about security, cryptography, blockchain, AI connected together. Uh, and we talk often about this topic, about the security of the data. But at uh, the end, as he said, uh, we have no real security. And uh, if we talk with Gianfranco later, we know more about security in his field. So I think the security level uh, uh, become from what there is uh, on the plate. If uh, the data, uh, what I'm going to, to catch is quite important data, the security become low. If the data is belong to one production line for producer refrigerator, for producer something like that, uh, today uh, technology is enough for safe the data because uh, who is interested to store the data or for, or, or for disrupt the data, uh, noisy the data, uh, they needed to invest so much money. And then at the end, the result is not enough to pay you back what you're going to invest for do that. So some kind of uh, blockchain or some kind of cryptography in some kind of field is already quite safety uh, uh, according to what you're going to manage. But if we talk about uh, uh, army or uh, aeronautics uh, or relation uh, in the boat belong to country like Japan, USA, Russia, something like that, um, there the budget, uh, we don't see uh, how much is the budget for, uh, for, for crack those data. So the, there is no security. So why, for example, the last meeting with Putin, uh, they go to talk face to face for don't, don't try to, to crack because uh, the technology cannot arrive to so much high uh, safety, we can say. Thanks, Gianluca. Uh, Gianfranco, I think yes. there's a lot to you this question. Yes, yes. So, of course, I think uh, both uh, Raid and Gianluca said uh, both catch the point. So, on one side, you have to put in a balance on how much you want to spend and uh, what is the risk that you or what is the benefit to go to the cloud is going to be the benefit more on how much you're going to spend to protect your cloud. So, of course, uh, there is always a balance that you need to, to make. So, in, uh, so, I think, of course, based on that, uh, uh, the whole aerospace sector, especially the one more uh, focused on military product, has been very, very prudent on that because... Uh, some things you just cannot do it, to be honest. Uh, you don't want the risk of national security is in some area is just too much for every country. And uh, so, you know, it's a no go. More on the commercial side of aerospace, it's, it's more of a balance, of course. Uh, internally, we are not still going. We are working with another company to create some, uh, well, we have a cybersecurity division. So we are, uh, one of our main area of business is that one. Uh, we're working also in other company to, pro to create uh, a protect, uh, protected cloud, but uh, on the, it still takes time and there's still gonna be some areas in which you don't want to go. So of course you go case by case, but it's still uh, some. It's still uh, quite a long walk, I think. Thanks, thanks, Gianfranco. Uh, Corrado, your field, uh, maybe um, um, cloud is uh, more reliable, of course, uh, instead of uh, the, the defense. In the case of Gianfranco, what's your opinion? 
Well, we are definitely not at the national security, uh, let's say, environment. Uh, what uh, what we see um, is that in in general, uh, the cloud is definitely more secure than other systems because wherever you know there is a human involved, there is always, let's say, the real backdoor is that one. It's not uh, is not the cloud itself. So that's why we always uh, push and try to convince uh, uh, with a lot of energy our clients uh, to use the cloud uh, cloud solutions because they are they are very robust and even though you know in China when we are dealing with data going going abroad uh, there could be some uh, let's say hiccups but we know there are solutions to to solve this um our clients uh, most of the times they are insisting to have uh, you know the data on, on premise uh, they talk about security of data but we know that sometimes it's because we are dealing with uh, water treatment companies so they don't want that their data stay in the cloud and uh, you know the environmental protection agency can access those data <laughs> and see what they are really doing <laughs> So it's uh, it's more on uh, let's say some uh, some compliance um, compliance issue that uh, let's say a national security level. So that's uh, that's our perspective on the on the topic. Clear, clear. Thanks, uh, Eric. In your opinion? Yeah, I mean, a security when it comes to cloud based. I mean, nothing is ever ever secure, right? Um, I mean, even from the advent of the internet back in the day, right? And nothing is ever secure. Um, I think when it comes to, especially these days with IoT, right? It's becoming, everything's becoming connected to the internet um, and it's becoming a major problem, right? Where you have uh, sort of botnet uh, hackers basically taking advantage of every single one of these um, IoT devices to sort of use uh, for, for, uh, for attacks, right? I mean, this distributed network of computed devices will keep uh, providing more ammunition right for hackers so I think um, at the same time like I think um, Professor Ryan also mentioned this is duality right um, is it about convenience um, or is it about other things right so uh, we use the cloud these days because it's more convenient for us uh, to put our personal data Right, even though it, whether it's Google or Alibaba, it doesn't matter, right? Um, somebody's gonna have access to that no matter how encrypted it is. Um, however, it saves us as individuals and humans time because I can access uh, you know, a power presentation on my phone as well as my computer or maybe eventually TV, right? So uh, it's, it's really about convenience. Um, but when it comes to, you know, I, I see it from sort of the the, the humanistic perspective, right? The individual consumer perspective, but at the same time, when we would look at a business or government perspective, right? It becomes a lot more complex. So uh, when we work on smart uh, manufacturing, right? For, for a machinery, right? Um, what about the CAD models that we receive, right? Do we put on the cloud? Do we put on our private cloud? Uh, can we actually uh, convince our customers, right? Uh, that it's okay to put it on this secure cloud, right? So. I guess it's really an order of magnitude of um, how they feel uh, comfortable with this type of secure data, right? Of course, when it you you upgrade a level to you know Department of Defense, et cetera, um, then you look at companies like Palantir, right? They've successfully created knowledge-based uh, a cloud network of data sharing between you know FBI, CIA, et cetera, to capture Bin Laden. So there's pros and cons for everything. Um, and I think that security when it comes to the individual is going to be sort of a long transformative path, right? Um, how much we give up um, or not, right? It's really up to the individual. Thanks, Eric. Uh, we just uh, have the last minutes, but I'd like to ask um, uh, just uh, the, the, the third question, because I think it's strictly related to sec the second one. In your opinion, dealing with the customers, uh, um, cloud technology is accepted by manufacturers, especially the, the old one, old style manufacturers. Um, Mr. Celani, Chil in your opinion, you have uh, experience in this? Uh, well, for uh, I work with the let's say old style company in uh, Shandong, textile company, 
and uh, well, they, they were changing completely their uh, <coughs> production style, and I suggested the uh, cloud solution. And the uh, the CEO is a very old guy, and uh, I tried to explain to him how it works, and for him it was impossible. His da his data are his data, so. Uh, uh, but talking with the uh, the general manager, younger than the CEO, he was eager to 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 move to, and he asked me to convince the big boss to <laughs> to move to. Uh, <laughs> so I, I think it's a matter of uh, generations. The uh, the new generation is uh, more keen to um, uh, to put the the not only the data but um, everything on the uh, on the cloud knowing that there are issues of security so everyone knows that uh, it's impossible to to secure but the the the, the balance is more uh, pushing towards putting the, uh, the the knowledge on the, the uh, on the cloud so i think it's uh, just a matter of generations the new generation is more uh, easy to to move on the, uh, on the cloud and then the trend is this and we've seen in the near future. I, I agree, I agree. Thanks. Uh, Gianluca, your opinion? Yeah, quite, quite fast. My point of view is, uh, uh, is it too early for the old generation uh, entrepreneur to move to the cloud? Because uh, they know, uh, they, are, they are contacted from the mobile phone, even that they didn't share the mobile phone, they got uh, the, the calls, they got advertising, they don't know why they, someone got the data. So uh, they don't trust the cloud. They think if my, da my data go inside one cloud, one service company, sure that service company sell my data to other, uh, to my competitor who pay more, especially in China. So in China, they don't trust so much in, in, my, in, my, in my experience, uh, give the, some data to the cloud, no problem. But other data to so the cloud, the personal uh, counting, uh, the, this kind of contact uh, cost, uh, never, never. They, they can spend a lot of money for their own server, but they will not give any data to anyone. Even to us, for, for assessing the data, it's quite difficult sometimes. So this is my opinion here in China. So I sort of mix the solution. Gianfranco, uh, in your uh, experience with your, with your clients and your uh, field, well, of course, uh, uh, most of all, or I think it's a little bit early as anticipated, uh, but I think it's more of a council generation of things. So, uh, and it's uh, how you grow up. So I make the comparison of what's happening in China. In China, if you look, nobody's using emails. Everybody's changing data with WeChat. I think the reason behind that, because we grew up uh, in the 90s, uh, early 2000, with the email, with that was our mail of method of, comp uh, of communication, and so we're used to that. They didn't have the computer back there. They just have now the smartphone WeChat, and so they use that. So of course, it's a matter of uh, younger generation are more used to that. So I think it's gonna be more on the age of the management to see when the company are ready to do that. It's kind of a generational gap that we have now, I think. Yes, I, I agree. I think we also see with, with our sons that uh, it's a different uh, mindset completely. Corrado, in your opinion? Well, we, we saw that, um, let's say, there are uh, two segments. Uh, the, um, the government companies, they don't like cloud for the reasons uh, the other experts already anticipated. But we notice, I mean, our experience is that with our private private clients, it's definitely easier to, let's say, sell the concept of, I mean, sell the cloud solution. Uh, and that's the reason why uh, we started with the, with the cloud solution, but now we are also offering uh, on-premise uh, solutions. And uh, we found also, uh, let's say, um, a way to, 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 to be, let's say, quick, uh, because we need to we need to train our models uh, continuously quickly and uh, of course on premise this uh, this becomes very very slow so um, but I'm sure that uh, the time will come when also the 
let's say the old so-called old generation and government uh, companies will uh, will accept uh, accept the cloud. What I usually tell them, I said, but you know, what is your issue? What is your problem? You are using your phone. You have your credit card there. You, all your messages are going through cloud. So, you know, in the end, uh, you are already exposed. So they look at me like, uh, yes, you are right, but <laughs> I still prefer to to stay <laughs> to keep my data within my walls, and they shall not go out. So we have to accept this for uh, for the for the time being. So that's why we have also developed our. Um, High, so-called hybrid solutions. Thanks, Corrado. Well, Eric, I think in your field, uh, manufacturers have to accept cloud technologies. What do yeah, you definitely. I mean, I think, it, you know, uh, everybody's starting to talk about hybrid, right? The hybrid cloud is definitely a thing um, for, for what does that mean, right? Does that mean that, that mean basically on-prem plus uh, cloud stuff, right? So. Uh, for customers who, I guess, you want to sort of transition them step by step towards uh, full, you know, online cloud capabilities by enabling them better, uh, you know, user experiences. That's something where it's a, a stopgap, right? A step by step approach. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, the, the the thing that comes to my mind is that uh, you look at um, the previous, you know, U.S. presidents, right? Previously, they were only allowed to use. Uh, potentially not even not even smartphone, but then the last couple um, have finally right, uh, used smartphones, whether it's uh, you know Apple or Android or something more secure. But they are smart, right? Everything you can access information at the palm of your hand. So I think um, no matter what, when it comes to um, our customers, right, for digital twinning, um, you know, governments, uh, the mass vast majority. We have to do on-prem, right? Because all of their data is very, very secure, or needs to be secure, right? Um, at the same time, um, for manufacturing, uh, smart factories, we are seeing uh, companies be more open uh, to be on sort of a, a public cloud, right? So again, really depends. Um, as long as there's a step-by-step -step approach, I think it's 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 easy to ease them into. Things because we can offer uh, other solutions or products that um, empower them across all of their devices if it's actually on uh, a public cloud versus only it's on-prem, then you gotta you know, connect with their own uh, company VPN to access that data, which is, to be honest, a pain, right? So I think because um, sort of the, uh, the management um, age, as, as, as they're starting to understand that, hey, their kids and their grandkids and children have access to information and they don't seem very affected by it, I think it's gonna be um, more, they're gonna be more open to these changes and, and uh, transformations of uh, digitalization. Thanks, Eric. And I want to thank you all. It was a, a very interesting uh, and uh, stimulating panel. And uh, we, we want to thank uh, everyone else from the behalf of uh, the European Online Forum. And uh, that's it. Thanks to all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. See you. Thank you so bye. much. Bye.